Modern military aircraft design is nearly unidentifiable compared to what it was even 20 years ago. From the 90s all the way up into the modern age, many jet aircraft, particularly in America, transitioned from a traditional style into a new era of design. The era of stealth fighters. Using advanced radar absorbent coatings as well as high-tech computers and engineering, stealth aircraft have transformed the engineering and tactics of combat aviation into something completely different over the course of the last 30 years. These stealth aircraft are the modern kings of the skies. Fast, capable, and undetectable. But there is a catch, of course. Stealth aircraft are expensive. With a giant price tag and an insane maintenance schedule, many stealth aircraft see astronomically higher production and operation costs than their counterpart aircraft. It's no surprise that only a select handful of superpower nations can actively produce and operate significant numbers of these stealth aircraft. Of course, as stealth technologies of the modern age become more available, we're seeing a change in that. But I believe that's well beyond the point. What about these nations that aren't superpowers? What about the nations that, for whatever reason, cannot develop stealth aircraft? Perhaps they do not have the ability to develop them, or maybe they don't have the money to run them, or maybe it seems like a far too costly option for the limited benefits they give. Perhaps these nations instead would be looking for what is commonly referred to as a Gen 4.5 design. Something that isn't necessarily stealth, but has the ability to compete with them for the ruler of the skies. That's what my aircraft, the MF-21 Eclipse, aims to do. Hey guys, it's Messier82, and welcome to my most ambitious project in flyout yet because I am addicted to one-upping myself. I know it's been a few minutes since my last video, but I had a few personal problems, as well as the fact that this project took me a very long time. It needed to be something with good multi-role, air-to-air, and air-to-ground capabilities that can still keep up with the technologies and engineering of the fifth generation. As one could imagine, this could be quite the challenge. So in order to keep up with Gen 5s, what sort of goals does this aircraft need to accomplish? And here it is, the Eclipse. Our Gen 4.5 fighter aircraft. As mentioned before, this aircraft needs to be a multi-role aircraft. This means it needs to be easily capable of air-to-air -air or air-to-ground operations. Essentially, it needs to be good at everything. Next, it needs to be able to evade the detection systems of stealth aircraft while simultaneously being able to detect them itself. Furthermore, it needs to use its advantages over stealth aircraft. It needs to be fast. Our top speed goal for this aircraft is Mach 2.5 with super cruise capabilities. On top of this incredible speed, it needs to be relatively efficient or at least long ranged. A minimum of one hour fuel time at full mill power is required, but my goal will be almost two without drop tanks. It also needs to be maneuverable. The ability to have very high instantaneous and sustained turn rates at any speed and altitude is a necessity. I am aiming for greater than or equal to 20 degrees per second on a full tank without a full armament. With a full armament, considering how heavy that is on this aircraft, I'd be willing to excuse numbers all the way down to 15 degrees per second. Speaking of armament, it needs to be very armament capable. Being able to put multiple tons of air-to-air -air or air-to-ground ordnance under its wings is a requirement. Lastly, it needs to be defendable. Modern countermeasures and decoy systems are required, especially when facing stealth aircraft. With all of our goals finally out of the way, let me show you guys how I built this aircraft. Let's start with the fuselage and wings. An extended main fuselage was added to the aircraft to make ample room for radar and IRST systems, of which I will add later. The aircraft would be designed as a twin-engine fighter with large delta wings in the rear as well as canards in the front. The large delta wings featured an incredibly large dog tooth as well as a leading edge extension. For those of you who have been with my channel a while, you will know that this is one of the most important defining factors of many of my designs. The leading edge and dog tooth combo generates vortices at the root of the wing. 
As your plane changes its angle of attack, or the angle at which the air hits the wings, that vortex gradually generates an area of low pressure over the wing. As you guys may know from the basic laws of entropy, this essentially pushes the aircraft upwards. And this is referred to as vortex lift. As this vortex lift travels down the root of the wings into the tail boom, large amounts of excess lift get provided for the entire airframe in a turn. This, combined with the general vortices that form on a delta wing, allow for very high amounts of lift at any speed, with the price of a little bit of extra drag. This tail boom plus delta wing plus giant lurk setup was in fact inspired by the conceptual flat pack, but of course it also had its own design elements that I personally added to it. But honestly, the Russian engineers may have been onto something here because this wing structure is easily one of the best ones for lift, efficiency, wave drag reduction, and pretty decent structural stability. And that's one of the reasons I replicated such a wing design. Of course, with my own modifications to improve it for the airframe. Moving forwards on the aircraft, two active canards on either side of the intakes ensured plenty of lift would be generated at all speeds. These canards were designed to constantly angle themselves towards the direction of the air, so as to always provide the highest lift drag ratios possible at any speed. In order to do this, a pitch response of negative 15 and an alpha response of 0.8 were added to the control surface. This, combined with the deltas, leading edge extensions at the root of the wing, and giant dog tooth, made for one of the most ridiculously maneuverable planes I have ever built, at least in the sake of practicality. This aircraft held a ridiculous lift drag ratio of over 11 to 1 at cruising speeds, as well as over 8 at optimal maneuvering speeds. For a jet fighter, that is absolutely insane. As we move forwards on the design, I started to build the canopy for the vehicle. As mentioned before, this vehicle would be a multi-role aircraft. That means that good air-to-air -air and air-to-ground capabilities were a necessity. Because of this, the aircraft would be a two-seater, hence the extended front fuselage from earlier. This would make the monitoring of all detection and targeting systems aboard the vehicle much easier, as well as keeping a second set of eyes for better situational awareness as a whole. Later, I would make sure that each canopy could open as well. Two variants of this aircraft, one with an autonomous detection and targeting suite in the back instead of a second seat, would probably be interesting to build too. Perhaps when you guys go to my Discord server to download this thing, I would include that variant. Also, in case you guys don't know, I'll do a little bit of shameless self-promotion here. I'm going to be posting all of my designs to my Discord server, so if any of you guys wish to download these and fly around with them, feel free to hop on my Discord server. Links in the description below. For such a powerful design, we would also need nothing short of equally powerful engines. Something I have noticed now that many of you have flyout is that many people design their engines to overperform. This generally isn't a good thing as in real life airframe limits exist that prevent people from doing this. Making a jet fighter that chews through all its fuel in 5 minutes but goes nearly Mach 2 on the deck is nothing short of a laughable idea. No, this thing needed to be powerful, practical, and relatively efficient. On top of that, the excess turbine temperatures of those extremely overperforming turbines would lead to ridiculous maintenance costs. So of course that was something we needed to avoid too. Anyways, these engines providing a greater than 1 to 1 thrust to weight ratio on a clean load were certainly powerful. At the same time, having an SFC of about 10 at low speeds mill power also ensured that our engines would be efficient and allow our aircraft to spend plenty of time in the air and maintain a high ferry range and a significantly lower operating cost than the higher, or rather hotter burning, counterparts. I tested several designs on the engine tester I have shown to figure out the engine for this design. This powerful engine would also require a powerful intake. Of course it's not required in flyout, but I like to err on the side of realism. In order to help us reach the speeds of Mach 2.5, an adjustable ramp intake was included in the design. Two doors as well as a diverter inside the intake were designed to generate an oblique shock inside the intake at supersonic speeds, of course without worrying about dirty air. This would aid in the compression process, allowing for more air and therefore more thrust to enter the engine at supersonic speeds. That, plus the general shape of the ramp intake being area rule compliant, ensured we would achieve the highest speeds possible. On top of this, the entire top end of the intake would adjust its angle with different incidents with the air. 
The ramp intake angled itself with the air in order to optimize the airflow as it entered the engine. I did this through a leading edge piece and a AOA response. This, all in all, optimized the aircraft for all engagements. Unfortunately, as mentioned earlier, these inlet dynamics weren't entirely modeled in flyout, but seeing as this was my most detailed aircraft yet, I wished to include them anyways. Moving on from that, we had to design the landing gear of this aircraft. The landing gear is surprisingly complex and featured a multitude of inputs for each section. Firstly, we added an input that delayed the closing and opening of certain landing gear sections to prevent clipping. Past that, we included a fast opening door that automatically opened and closed to let the landing gear panels slide seamlessly in. This was all controlled, of course, with the simple press of the G key, so no complex inputs were required for the pilot to retract the gear, as that was all done by the input engineering. Past that, we also had to include a landing slash taxi light flap that would only deploy and be activated when the landing gear was out, once again taking the load off the pilot for activities outside of flying the aircraft. Reducing the complexity of onboard systems was one of the biggest advantages of these aircraft as the pilot could simply focus on flying. Finally continuing, we moved on to the guns and gun ports. The gun port design was rather close to the cockpit, which was kind of concerning, but there was a reason for this. Either way, our vents were pointed in a way to minimize gun debris getting near the canopy. The reason for this is that the integrated gun ports doubled as a vortex generator for the fuselage. While this wasn't incredibly significant, it helps provide extra aerodynamic lift, therefore making our turns even more efficient for a non-existent drag penalty as the guns needed to exist either way. Speaking of which, the guns on this aircraft were two 25mm autocannons firing at an astounding 1700 RPM each. In order to compensate, each gun had their own ram air cooling vent and diffuser to keep the guns hopefully from overheating in most scenarios. From here on out, it was finally time to design the detection and EW systems of the aircraft. Again, not fully modeled in flyout, but I didn't really care. When fighting all of these advanced aircraft, having dynamic and competent sensing equipment was a necessity. While they aren't in flyout yet, I still modeled all of these theoretical sensory stations. Starting with the nose of the aircraft, IFF reflectors, sometimes in this form referred to as bird slicers, were positioned at the nose as well as further down the body. These IFF reflectors were designed to respond to an interrogation signal sent by the friendly radar. After the correct readback is sent to the friendly aircraft, the radar and IFF system flags the aircraft as friendly. This allows for more situational awareness as well as helps prevent friendly aircraft from accidentally shooting each other down, especially in the age of BVR combat. Moving back on the aircraft, several radar warning receivers as well as missile approach warning systems were placed near the intakes facing forwards, as well as towards the back at the end of the tail booms, as well as atop the vertical stabilizers. These two systems are integral parts of modern designs, as the radar warning receiver, or RWR for short, alerts you of when an aircraft is locking you with its radar, or even firing a missile upon you. The Missile Approach Warning, or MAW for short, is a subset of detection systems on an aircraft specifically dedicated to scanning for missiles. This acts as a second, better set of eyes for the pilot. Whenever a missile is launched on the aircraft, the MAW system will alert the pilot of a missile and the direction of launches, as well as be able to go as far as to launch countermeasures on the pilot's behalf to prevent the missile from connecting with its target. This system essentially gives pilots eyes on the back of their head and almost entirely ensures that no missile goes undetected. Speaking of countermeasures, the countermeasure system on this aircraft was also rather advanced. Modern missiles are rarely confused by simple systems such as chaff and flare, so we needed something new to protect our pilots from the missile along with the traditional chaff and flare setup. Four simulated radar decoys were positioned in the back of the craft. These systems have been seen in most modern generations of aircraft such as the F-35, the Eurofighter, and other vehicles. The radar decoy emits radio signals in a pattern that fools the radar and the missile into perceiving it as the real target. In the best scenario, this completely fools the missile, and in other scenarios may simply confuse it. By traveling at a flight path and emitting signals that are similar to a real fighter jet, it's almost impossible to tell it apart from a real target from the missile's perspective. Adding these four simulated, of course, radar decoys in the back of the aircraft was essential to keeping our pilots safe. 
A door and launcher were activated with the Y key on the keyboard. Once again moving to the nose of the aircraft, several dynamic sensors are required to keep the aircraft in the air. The pitot tube, for example, spelt P-I-T-O-T, -T, is a device for measuring airspeed. Without one, a pilot or flyby wire can't determine the aircraft's true airspeed and therefore would be unable to accurately fly the aircraft. Two fully working alpha indexers were also placed at the nose of the aircraft. I modeled them myself and I'm rather proud of that. These essentially work like a weather vane. They're just telling the aircraft at all times the angle at which the air is hitting the wings. This is crucial for determining various aircraft conditions such as stalls for example. We also painted on a simulated static port. This realistically would measure the air pressure, temperature, and a few other valuable pieces of information about the static environment around the aircraft. Without these three pieces of equipment, the flyby wire of the aircraft would not work, at least in real life. The aircraft would essentially not be able to fly. Because of this, some redundancy was included with multiple usable active sensor systems aboard the aircraft. There is also a quote-unquote manual control system that allows the pilot to completely disable the flyby wire in the seemingly impossible event of all sensors or the flight control computer being completely destroyed. At this point, we were complete with all the major external modeling of the aircraft, and it was no surprise that this was shaping up to be my most advanced build yet. But it was time to move on to the paint. There isn't really that much to talk about in terms of the paint. The top of the aircraft was painted a very dark, almost black color. Panels were marked with a red accent, and the bottom of the aircraft had a cream white paint to it, along with the Radome and EW systems aboard the aircraft sharing this same color. A small heat shield ribbon was added to the central fuselage around the radar decoy launcher, as well as around the variable nozzles for the engines. For detail work, the paint finished up with small details such as a marked static port, as mentioned before, a board number, and call signs for the pilots aboard the aircraft. To aesthetically improve the aircraft as well as improve its safety, some lights were added to the aircraft. Two sets of nav lights were added to the wings and intakes as well as a singular tail nav light facing backwards. Strobes were added for anti-collision, as well as two beacon lights on top and bottom of the aircraft. This, combined with the landing and taxi lights, essentially just reduces the chances of a collision, whether it be in the air or on the ground. The lights allow those looking up to see your plane, as well as its direction, especially at nighttime. This is very important for operating in civilian or friendly airspaces. Lastly, this was a combat aircraft. Formation lights were also added along the vertical stabilizers and fuselage. The air brake of this vehicle was another interesting modification. When placing an air brake, unless it's vertically symmetrical, such as the air brake on the A-10 or F-16, you need to place it as close to the center of mass as possible. This makes it so no unnecessary forces are acting on the aircraft. For example, if this air brake was close to the rear of the aircraft, it would pitch us upwards. This is not only unnecessary, but potentially dangerous in a landing scenario. So with our center gravity compliant air brake complete, our entire external airframe was just about done. From that point on, I moved to the weapon hardpoints. I modeled my own weapon hardpoints in order to avoid impact with the slats or elevators of the aircraft. For the weapons, I downloaded two very wonderful weapons packs from two very talented 3D designers, one of which is Invalid Crow, who is a mod on my server, as well as this guy. I'm not going to try and pronounce that name, but he makes a lot of awesome weapons and even is the reason one of the variable geometry nozzles was added to fly out, the one I'm using on this craft that is. The aircraft featured AIM-120s and JSAO glide bombs that were installed from these modders. On top of that, the default in-game AIM-9s were set up with the ability to have an actually working missile on the aircraft. The point of this armament setup was to show that this vehicle was designed with both air-to-air -air and air-to-ground capability in mind. Finishing up the exterior of this aircraft, I did a little bit of extra airframe tweaking as I got to the cockpit. This involved adjusting my flyby wire, adding auto trim in the form of a mock response to the elevators, as well as ensuring the weight and balance remained optimal with or without the armament I just slapped on the bottom of the aircraft. On top of that, I added a control lock activated with the U key in order to put the control surfaces at a resting position when the aircraft is turned off. And with that, the entire exterior of the plane is finally complete. Now, let's move on to another very complex part of the aircraft, the interior. 
As mentioned before, this aircraft would be a Gen 4.5 aircraft, and that means an updated interior compared to my previous build. So a full glass UFD was the first thing I was working on. The entire frontmost panel would be a large glass touchscreen, along with a semi-glass radio panel to the right. As this was a fighter aircraft designed to fly and conduct operations in potentially civilian or friendly territories, whether it be flying over, training, or refueling, of course we needed to include a transponder on this aircraft. Initially, I added the transponder code of 1200 for civilian VFR traffic as I thought it would be funny in a fighter jet, but for the sake of accuracy, I changed the transponder code to 4000. This transponder code is for military aircraft conducting training operations, or you know, any aircraft that may be changing its altitude significantly for whatever reason. From there, we included the aviation six pack, three MFD panels, FCS toggles, a landing gear emergency hook door, a control lock, a parking brake, a gear lever, jettison panels, a dedicated armament panel, a dedicated navigation panel, heaters for the pitot tube and cabin, de-ice, APU, and engine startup switches. Whew. Next, there was an engine panel complete with fuel flow, engine state, RPM, fuel selectors, and afterburner lights, radar and IRST startup switches, fire extinguishers, canopy retract, AV and battery master, and of course, cabin lights. Oh man, that's a lot of stuff. Also, I added a picture of my cat Bo to the inside of the cockpit as a little taped down charm. Cause who doesn't love Bo? He's a great cat, I love him. I'll make sure to send pictures of him, or at least post pictures of it in the video. Speaking of which, the weapons panel was rather interesting as I tried to optimize it over other similar designs. Firstly, a red light was added to the panel. The purpose of this was essentially just to light up when the master arm was on, so you don't need to look at the switch or anything, you could just see the light in your peripheral and know that it's on. Next, I added three options for attack. Air to air, air to ground, and ACM. The ACM button would theoretically just put your plane in dogfight mode, aka ACM slash radar slash IR, as well as automatically having your aim nines and guns selected for dogfights. This makes it so that in the event you merge with another aircraft, you can just slap one big old button and not waste time configuring your aircraft. Otherwise, the aircraft was relatively normal with all of its features and switches, most of which were color-coded in some way to make it all a little bit easier for the pilot. Speaking of making it easier for the pilot, the Wizzo also existed in the back. They were given a pretty simple setup similar to what you might see in the backseat of an F-15E for example. The full glass UFDs from the front was more or less copied back along with a linear panel for four separate MFDs lined up below that. Of course, having many MFDs and panels for clicking on stuff or seeing stuff was required for a Wizzo. From there on out, there was a simple arm and control panel for the canopy, the ejection handle, and a few of the aircraft's gauges. And with over 660 individual parts, as well as the 9 custom control inputs, this beautiful and way too complex aircraft was finally complete. It was time to fly out once again, so I'll see you guys in the sky. Enjoy!